The restrictions and how to make an access to information act request. And if you have any questions, feel free just to interrupt me. So before you search with any type of historical or uh, research of any kind really, the more information you know, the better about the individual you're gonna be researching. So you need to know their full name, their date of birth, birthplace, date of death, and then of course it's helpful if you know their parents' names, preferably their full names, what branch or corps they served in, unit and or company, and service number. While you wouldn't need all of that to get the information you seek, the more information you have, the better. Uh, the, one, the least, at least you need their full name, date of birth, date of death, and if possible, service number, because that's their unique identifier within the military. So the main sources of Canadian Second World War records is the Library and Archives of Canada, the Government of Canada and Veterans Affairs Canada, the Gazette and Canada Gazette, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and this one is a more Saskatchewan based. Obviously if the individual you're researching was not from Saskatchewan, this one won't apply, but uh, seeing as though we live in Saskatchewan, it may apply. The Saskatchewan Virtual War Memorial, and then the Unit War Diaries. So the Library and Archives of Canada, they're located at 395 Wellington Street, Ottawa, or yeah, Ottawa, Ontario. They hold an extensive collection of records and other documentation on Canadians who have served their country and those who have served in the Northwest Mounted Police and the early RCMP. They hold the service records for the following. Before 1914, the First World War, Canadian Forces Regular Force, 1919 to 1997, Canadian Forces Reserves, 1919 to 2007, and Newfoundland Militia, Second World War. And of course, at that time, Newfoundland was its, a separate country, and that's why they're uh, a se separate uh, record group. So the types of military records that the Library and Archives holds include muster rolls, service files, unit war diaries, metal registers, photographs, documentary art, posters, and published sources. So the types of Second World War records that they have are the service files, both the non-restricted and restricted files, and we'll get into that a little bit later. War graves registers, war diaries, ship logs, and Royal Canadian Air Force operational record books, photographs and maps, personal papers, diaries, correspondence, documentary art, posters, and other Department of Defense funds in Record Group 24. So our first one that we'll get into here is the service files. And this is the one that everyone's more or less gonna be the most interested in. So the service files of the Second World War War Dead, 1939 to 1947, is a database held at the Library and Archives website. It holds reference to some 44,090 Canadians who by land, sea, and air gave their lives during the Second World War, 24,525 of which served in the Army. And just out of curiosity, approximately 1,159,000 Canadians and Newfoundlanders served at some point during the Second World War. This database includes all those who were killed in action, died of wounds, or died of illness or accident while in service. It also includes those who subsequently died in the following years of service-related injuries and illness. The database is comprised of an index, as well as having the digitized service files that are available in PDF format. Uh, the majority of them are digitized as of last year. I know they just did a whole bunch of them. I don't know if all of them are on there, but it, it, it's pretty close to all of them. So this is one of the non-restricted databases and it has been added to their new collection search function. They just redid their website and made it 
far more easier to navigate than before. For an individual to be included in this database, the serviceman must be in the Commonwealth War Graves Commission database, as well as the book, Books of Remembrance held at the Peace Tower in Ottawa. That's how they verify that they were uh, a casualty. Each database entry gives the following information. Their full name, the age, date of birth, date of death, their rank, unit, what uh, force, so like if they were in the Army, Navy, what, whatever it may be, their service number, a reference number, a volume number, and additional info. The additional info is usually just their next of kin, uh, usually their parents, their spouse. It also gives an item number and the related PDF. Uh, genealogy packages are also digitized for all service files at Ancestry. Uh, the difference between the two is the genealogy packages are just the most important documents. They're kind of just the ones that they picked out, whereas the ones at the library and archives is the full file. Uh, a lot of the documents inside the files uh, were required to be made in triplicate, and that's why you see some of the files, they can be anywhere from 10 documents to 900. It, it just depends. So our next one we're going to get into here is the service files of the Royal Canadian Navy, 1910 to 1941 ledger sheets. Uh, these are sometimes often called the Navy pay ledger sheets, although they rarely contain information regarding sailors' pay. This database contains reference to 16,788 individuals who served in the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Navy Volunteer Reserve between the years of 1910 and 1918, as well as those who served from 1919 to 1941, and those of the Newfoundland Naval Reserve. The information included in this database is the date and place of birth, occupation, so that would be their civil occupation, what they did prior to enlistment, a physical description, name and address of their next of kin, and their dates of service. Uh, if the date and place of birth is not listed in the index, then that was not recorded on the original document at that time. So parts of a Second World Service file, as I mentioned, at times there can be anywhere between 10 to 900 documents in some of these files. Uh, the main ones that are in there are going to be the attestation papers or enlistment papers. Uh, Pay documents regarding units, ships, squadrons uh, that they served in or on. Their postings and movements, so that'll be every different place. Every time they move to a different area or a different posting, it'll list that and it'll give dates. Uh, medical and dental records, so it'll have if they ever were hospitalized, whether it be uh, service related or if they were out on leave and they tripped and fell and broke their wrist, whatever it may be. Evaluation reports, whether they were uh, good at their job, if their conduct was good or if their conduct was poor. It'll also have a document regarding medal entitlements, showing what uh, medals and decorations they are entitled to, as well as discharge and death records. Service files do not include information about battles that they served in. This is strictly about the movements and personal information of that individual soldier. The War Graves Registers. While these records mostly pertain to the First World War, there are some volumes that do contain info on Canadian service members who died in Canada and the US during the Second World War. Uh, these records have been digitized and can be found on Ancestry, and I believe that's the only place that they've been digitized at the moment. Uh, these are searchable in the Library and Archives database, but uh, you would have to order uh, that individual sheet from them. So they charge you on that website? For, uh, for reproductions, they do charge for reproductions, but uh, to search these databases it does not cost anything. <clears throat> A lot of the stuff on there is free when it comes to just uh, ordering documents and reproductions is where, where they charge you. And it's actually, they don't even do it, it's a third party company. So our next one here is going to be the War Diaries, ships logs, and operational records books for the Royal Canadian Air Force. 
So the war diaries, they're a daily log of the activities of Canadian Army units on active service. They contain information about the locations and operations of a unit. So this would be where you would learn more about the battles and the actual events that took place. Rarely do they mention individuals by name, other than reference to some officers, usually senior ones. Uh, a lot of times it will reference the, the officer writing it, so the adjutant. Uh, but sometimes it does uh, mention individual soldiers by name. I've, I've noticed throughout all my years of research that the First World War ones tend to do that more often than the Second World War ones. So to how to search for these, you would use the collection search function at the Library and Archives, and you would use Finding Aid 2460, and then you would type in the name of the unit, corps, regiment, division, or service, because at each level of the military would have a war diary. So you can you know, research a specific unit, or you can go all the way up to that division, what have you. Uh, some of the volumes are available mass digitized on microfilm reels at the LEC partner site, Heritage Canadiana. So ship's logs, they're basically the Navy's form of a war diary, and they basically are the same thing. They record daily logs for the Canadian naval vessels, including minesweepers, trawlers, and submarines. Other info uh, contained in them is routine activities both at sea and at harbor, weather and sea conditions, ship movements, details of operational exercises and special events, whether or not senior officers came to visit, what have you. And again, like War Diaries, they contain very little personal information on individuals. And you will find, re reading through these, some of the, sometimes it's very detailed and it can be hour by hour accounts or it could be as short as it rained today. It, it really just depends on the events of that day or, and who, who was writing it as well. Some were more detailed than others. So to search for these, it's basically the, the same idea. You would use the collection search function, advanced search, collections and fonts, and then in the section where it says all these words, you would key in R24 log and then the vessel's name that you're looking for. <coughs> Royal Canadian Air Force operational record books. These document the flying operations and other events related to Canadian squadrons, groups, training schools, <coughs> stations, and other units. And as some of you may know, there was a RCAF training school near Swift Current here at the Swift Current Airport. So if anyone's interested in researching that, uh, this may be a help to you. Uh, if the unit was an operational one, the records will include details of the missions flown, list the aircraft and aircrew involved. So it'll tell you the, even right down to the serial number of those aircraft, even the serial numbers of the engines on those aircraft as well. So again, to search for these, it's how you would search, just like how we did the other one there, collection search, advanced search, collections and fonts database, and then RG24-E-7, and then the name of the squadron or unit. Again, some of these are on the partner site, Heritage Canadiana. Our next one that we're going to talk about is the medal records. So the Library and Archives has a database called the Military Medals, Honours and Awards, 1812 to 1969, and this contains the medal registers for all those who received Military Medals, Honours and Awards between 1812 and 1969. Uh, some of these medals include uh, from the War of 1812, the Fenian Raids, Red River Expedition, the Egypt campaign of the 1882 to 1889, uh, the Northwest Rebellion, the Boer War, and of course both the Second World Wars and up to 1969. Uh, it's interest, or important to note, sorry, that this does not include those uh, award, the awards for service related and campaign awards. This is strictly for uh, actions and valor awards. So e each. Sorry. Each database entry contains some or, some or all of the following information. The item number, the full name, rank, regiment, and 
uh, service number of the individual, the medal, honor, or, or award being awarded, the date of award, the time period, so it'll, be, it'll give you a period of dates when this would have been awarded, as well as when the action would have taken place. The authority, so that's where it'll have either LG or CG, and we'll get into that in a little bit here, but that stands for London Gazette and Canada Gazette. Any remarks, the volume number, page number, microfilm reel number, and a reference number. A lot of those are just so to help you find that and do your citations. Uh, sometimes they do have type citations for the reason for the award being awarded, uh, but many of the citations are the same as what's in the Canada Gazette and London Gazette. Uh, these are also digitized and available on Ancestry as well. So the London and Canada Gazette. So the London Gazette has a long history. It's been around for roughly 350 years. It's the official newspaper of the Crown and was the first official journal of record. It is an authoritative and reliable source of news. Uh, it's famous for publishing official events from the War Office and the Ministry of Defense. Uh, these events include listing those awarded mention in dispatches, listing individuals who are recognized for their actions in operational theaters, appointments to new posts, promotions in rank, acts of gallantry, and those who received medals, honors, and awards. It was from this do or, uh, publication that the term being gazetted was coined. That's when an individual's name is published in there, it's, you're considered to have been gazetted. So the Canada Gazette, very similar to the London Gazette, and it's the Cana official newspaper of the Canadian government, and has been published without break since 1841. It's used to inform Canadians about government operations and involve them in the legislative process. Items published in the Canada Gazette include statutes, new and proposed legislations, administrative board decisions, public notices such as medals, honors, and awards. Researchers can search the digital issues of the Canada Gazette at the Library and Archives website. So the years they have are 1841 to 1997. For the more current issues, so 1998 to the present, can be found on the Canada Gazette website. There also is a section on the Governor General of Canada's uh, website that uh, talks about the Canada Gazette as well. So when you're searching for this, if you go into the Military Medals, Honours and Awards database and you find the individual you're looking for, and it says LG24 or w whatever it may be, so the number after LG is the issue number, so that's the issue of that publication that you're going to want to look for. So personal papers, diaries, and correspondence. The library and archives hold some correspondence, papers, journals, and diaries that belong to the Second World War veterans. These can be found using the collection search as well. Photos and map records held at the library and archives. So they have a database called the Faces of the Second World War, and it's a database of images of those who served in the Second World War. There's roughly 2,500 of them, I believe. Uh, there's also the Air Photo Interpretation Service, Canadian Army Photos, Directorate of Heritage and History, who does the maps. There's also other photographs and maps, and they can be searched just using relevant keywords in collection search. So if you type in Battle of Vimy Ridge, it'll bring up results for all the images that they have uh, in relation to the Battle of Vimy Ridge. So we'll talk a little more about the, the, uh, the image database, Faces of the Second World War. As I stated, it contains roughly 2,500 images. Uh, covers all the branches, so Army, Navy, Air Force. Uh, these images, when they're found in the database, they can be printed or saved to your computer. You can also get higher quality reproductions through the Library and Archives reproduction service. Oh, 
it went a little farther, sorry. Documentary art and posters. They hold a decent amount of posters and documentary art and again can be searched through the collection search. Uh, for most people, if you're researching an individual, that may not be relevant, but it might be just if you're interested in wartime posters, uh, you know, the ones that say buy war bonds, what have you, that might be something to look at. Published sources. The Library and Archives also has an extensive library collection in addition to their archival materials. Uh, in relation to the Second World War, they have many books pretty much covering all aspects of Canadian involvement. And these can be found via the Library and Archives Aurora function. That's their database for their library catalog. Uh, the most comprehensive books are those that were official histories of the branches of the Canadian Armed Forces. And these have been digitized by the Director of History and Heritage. Uh, you also can search for these in the collection search using keywords. So restricted records at the library and archives. The, the following are non-restricted records. So all records before the First World War, those of the First World War, and those who died in service during the Second World War, including those from injury, illness, and accident, as well as those related to medals, honors, and awards are not restricted. These can be freely accessed and searched on their website. All other Second World War service files, and basically from 1919 to the present, all those records are restricted, and that's due to privacy legislation, which governs personally identifiable information. While a good, a good number of those who served in the Second World War probably are no longer living, uh, it goes by the theory that it's possible that they're still living and their information needs to be protected. So at this time, only staff members at the Library and Archives can access this database. And for individuals such as myself or anybody else to access these records post-1919, we have to do an Access to Information Act request, or ATIP. We're going to talk about that a little later in the presentation here because it kind of, it's a topic all on its own. So digitized documents at Heritage Canadiana. As I mentioned a couple of times, Heritage Canadiana is a website database that holds many digitized photos and documents related to Canadian history. A good portion of that is uh, from the Library and Archives. They're kind of a, a third party uh, partner. Uh, all of these are mass digitized, however, and you would have to search through individual images. They're, they're not indexed, unfortunately. So our next major source here is the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. They're located at 2 Marlow Road, or yeah, 2 Marlow Road, Maidenhead, in the United Kingdom. They are funded by six member governments. Canada is one of them. They care for and maintain all the Commonwealth War cemeteries in 23,000 locations around the world, and they commemorate 1.7 million Commonwealth service men and women who have given their lives. They have two databases which are particularly useful to researchers and genealogists. They are the Fine War Dead and the Fine War Memorials and War Cemeteries databases. They also have an app and you can search from that on the go on your phone. So the Commonwealth War Graves Commission Fine War Dead database. It contains entries from both world wars and it contains the information on all those buried in their cemeteries. The information in each entry of the database includes the soldier's name, rank, service number, unit or ship, the exact burial or memorial location, country of service, and additional information, such as their next of kin, as well as the personal headstone inscription, if one. Some, some have them, some don't. Each individual soldier entry has a downloadable and printable Commonwealth War Graves Commission certificate that you can print off and frame and put on, put on the wall. Uh, it'll also have additional infor or, uh, images as well of the ledgers that they hold. So that'll be you know documents related to the headstone, grave registration, uh, if they 
were removed from a previous burial spot. As it was common, soldiers would be buried in the field and then later when these cemeteries were uh, built, they would move other burials into here. So it'll have documents related to the reburial. The fine war memorials and war cemeteries. This is uh, good for background information about, about the cemetery that the individual is buried in. So it contains information on all the 23,000 Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries and memorials around the world. Each entry includes the country and region it's located in, the GPS coordinates, total number of casualties buried in that cemetery, what wars and conflicts they are from, information and directions of how to get there, a digital map of the area, images of the cemetery and or memorial, as well as historical information of the cemetery and those buried there. To our next source here, Government and Veterans Affairs Canada sources. The Canadian Virtual War Memorial is a database located on the Veterans Affairs Canada website. The database is a registry designed to honour and remember all those who have given their lives in service to Canada, which is roughly 118,000 Canadians since the time of Confederation. It also includes an honor roll for the RCMP, so all those who died in service with the RCMP are included there as well. All the names of the individuals of this database are the ones that are inscribed in the eight books of remembrance held in the Peace Tower, which of course is part of our Parliament building. So each entry includes the individual's military or police service, their personal data, location of burial or memorial, in many cases, it'll also feature images of the individual, whether that be from a newspaper clipping or a, uh, a scanned photo. A lot of those photos that are on there are, are uploaded by a group who is responsible for the Operation Picture Me uh, project, if you've ever heard of that. You also can, there's a couple of links on the page when you find the individual you're looking for, and it'll take you to a separate page on the website where it'll show you an image of the entry in the Books of Remembrance, and you're able to download a high resolution copy of that uh, page. The next government source here we have is the Canadian Army Overseas Honours and Awards 1939 to 1945. So this is located on the Gover Government of Canada website as well. Uh, to search for this, you can just type in that heading and it'll, it'll be the first result. And it consists of the original Canadian Army Overseas Honours and Awards citations for the Second World War. The information included includes all nominations for all ranks, civilians, supervisors, as well as nursing sisters. Uh, information that's not included in this database is any nominations made within Canada as well as it's missing the complete documentation that would be required for awarding a Victoria Cross. The documents that are attached to each entry can be viewed and downloaded as a PDF right to your computer. Our next source is the Saskatchewan Virtual War Memorial. The Saskatchewan Virtual War Memorial commemorates Saskatchewan's war dead and supplements the physical memorial that stands on the legislature grounds in Regina. It features some 12,000 war casualties from the 1885 rebellion all the way up to Afghanistan. Each entry in the database includes the following if it's known. Rank, name, date of death, service details, a short narrative history of the individual. Sometimes they have images uh, additional information, personal information, and it also will give you copyright information as well. So now we're moving on to secondary sources. So all these ones here were your primary sources, but these ones are more just to add to your research, or if you can't find something through your primary sources, you may have to look into secondary sources. So these are Provincial and local archives, 
the International Committee of the Red Cross, if the individual you're searching for was a prisoner of war, the International Committee of the Red Cross holds all records related to prisoners of war, both First and Second World War. Provincial and local museums, local branches of the Royal Canadian Legion, other veteran service organizations. Uh, there's a couple of publications from the Royal Canadian Legion that can be of help, such as the Legion Magazine Last Post, which is a part of Legion Magazine that lists uh, veterans who have passed away. So if you're searching for an individual who may have passed away, it's possible that it's in there. Uh, the other one is the military service recognition books that are made by Saskatchewan Command. Uh, you can get physical copies down at the Legion here in Swift Current. You also can go through all the different uh, editions that they have on the Saskatchewan Provincial Command website and you can view them as a PDF file that way as well. You can also try local cenotaphs and churches. Many have honor rolls of uh, local individuals who served and lost their lives as well. Local cemeteries that have veterans plots or fields of honor. Or you can try local armories and bases. They may have archives themselves. Other ones include regimental and branch associations, regimental museums and histories, the Canadian War Museum, Veterans Affairs Canada, Department of Defense, websites and archives of still active units. Many of the units that served during the Second World War that are still active do have some information. Military museums, university libraries and archives. You also can try family history books and local history books as well as you can try local genealogical and historical societies. They may be able to point you in the, the right direction if you're looking for some specific. And probably the, the part everyone was probably waiting for me to get to. <laughs> I would imagine so. Access to information requests. So this is what you would need to do if you're researching an individual who did not die in service during the Second World War. So making access to information requests can be done via the Library and Archives website or you can do it by mail. They do have a, a form that you can download and print off and mail to them. I, I found doing it all on the website is a lot easier and it, it's quite fast. Uh, there's two different types of requests. There's informal and formal. I would suggest always doing the formal one. It only costs five dollars uh, and that way it uses legislation to force them to give you an answer within 30 days or ask for an extension. And at that time, after it passes that 30 days, you are entitled to file a complaint saying, hey, you know, you're not doing your job kind of thing, right? <laughs> so what is required when making an access to information request request? So for persons living, it will require written consent from that individual in question Persons deceased less than 20 years. Limited info is released and only to immediate family member if proof of relation or proof of death is provided. Proof of death is not necessary if they died in service. So if you're searching for an individual who served during the Korean War and was killed in action, you would still have to make an ATIP request, but you won't need proof of death because the government knows that they were a casualty. Uh, the only way Others, other than immediate family members can access this information. I, I do this quite often uh, as, through my work as a genealogist and that is uh, there's a form that the individual you're researching for would have to sign giving you permission to access that information on their behalf. So essentially acting as an agent on, on their behalf. For persons deceased more than 20 years, information is released if proof of death is provided. And again, no proof of death is required if that death was in service. So acceptable forms of proof of death. That includes death certificate, newspaper obituary, funeral notice, and a photograph of the headstone or gravestone, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. You can do all of these or you can do just one of these. I, in my experience, if you have more than one, it's usually beneficial. It allows them to identify that person a lot quicker. 
Acceptable forms of proof of relationship include newspaper, newspaper obituary, sorry, baptism certificate, marriage certificate, or full form birth certificate. The uh, wallet size birth certificates, they will not accept that. It has to be the, the full form ones. And all documentation has to, that's proving relationship must clearly show the relation between the requester and the individual in question. Both names have to appear on the documentation, both full names. If you're searching for information or records on your, yourself, you can make a request for records that pertain to yourself as that is your right as a Canadian citizen. So if you're a veteran and you're wanting to access your records uh, and they were prior to 1997 and held at the Library and Archives, you could submit a request and they would have to honor that request because that's your right as a Canadian citizen to access information on yourself. And I already talked about that, the, the 30 days. And then I do have the ULRs to all the, the different databases. Uh, this particular presentation, I actually use it for a, a workshop that I do and it's a, a little more interactive where we, as we go through the slides, everyone gets to search the databases for an individual and they can kind of see it. Uh, unfortunately today we just didn't have time to do that. So. Any questions? What's that, sorry? Oh, excellent. Well, thank you for your service. know the name, probable birth date, how successful would that be? As long as you have, really, if you have the name and their date of birth, usually that, that would be enough for them to be able to tell you whether or not there is an individual. Uh, it, if you can't prove that they died, that, that might be the issue. Uh, like they, I know like if you're searching for an individual and you give them a name, uh, Archivist can look in, in that database and look and say there's this many people with that name and then you would have to research those individuals to find out if they are in fact deceased or what the case is of those individuals. So like let's say even if the person was born, I'm going to throw 1910, the government's probably not smart enough to figure out that they're most likely deceased. Yeah, you, yeah. when it comes to accessing because it's protected information, you, you, you have to prove that that individual is deceased. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose I could. Uh, I don't have extras on me at, at the moment, but uh, if you want to give me your information, I, I can get a copy to you. Okay, yeah. So w in the service record, it will tell you what medals and decorations they're entitled to. Uh, on that sheet, it will be just the uh, service and campaign related ones. But if you search the military medals, honors and awards, you can determine whether or not they uh, were awarded a valor award. Okay, it lo uh, lost. Okay, so yeah, lost medals. Uh, yeah, so you would have to contact Veterans Affairs Canada for that. Uh, they, they don't do First World War medals. Any First World War medals, they won't issue uh, replacements. But for Second World War until uh, recent times here, they, they will. They, they would look at the records and go, okay, yeah, he's entitled to this one. <laughs> Thank you.